there's a couple of things I, I want to just talk about here really quickly, just that um, uh, what we're talking about here is FOIA, Freedom of Information. FOIA is this name of a US act, but it's because it's a global phenomenon and crowdsourcing. These are two concepts that do not usually go together. Um, but as as Blanca and, and Bass are going to show, particularly Bass's presentation, uh, they really should, you know, and one of these things, these things are both, um, you know, can be, one can use, be used to, to, to propel the other. Um, I will point out only that both these concepts are modern. Um, they are, these are fairly new tools, um, new and you know, certainly in freedom of information is, is a, uh, is a, uh, I'm learning a basically a post-war phenomenon, and uh, Michael Shedson, friend of CMDS, a Columbia prof, friend of mine, wrote a book about it recently called The Rise of the Right to Know. And we learned that, I always thought it was a post-Watergate phenomenon, but basically it's about that era of turmoil in the 60s where um, people's rising expectations about government, rising dissatisfaction with government, demand for more Pre, more transparency from government, gave rise to these laws, the Freedom of Information Act in the US, I learned was passed in 66 by Lyndon Johnson, who was, you know, very reluctant apparently, but went ahead and did it anyway because of the social pressure. I'll note also that it was the exact same period where um, investigative reporting uh, uh, reemerged in the United States, as I uh, outlined in a, in a book I wrote, as part of, again, this sort of changing attitudes toward authority. So this was, th these are fairly new laws in the, in the freedom of the, uh, the post Watergate explosion and this phenomenon began in, in you know, in, in 74 forward and, and Bass is the expert. He's gonna, he's gonna, um, he's gonna school, school us on that. And the other uh, thing we're talking about uh, crowdsourcing is even more recent vintage um, I wrote a piece about basically tracing this, uh, the whole idea, or to me, for me, it traces back to the rise of the network society. And I was just able to find uh, uh, Manuel Castell's book. I don't know if anybody's read it. Uh, this was a, a mid 2000s book, uh, probably 99, The Rise of the Network Society by Manuel Castells. And it's this phenomenon that came, you know, that, that, that accompanied the rise of the internet that basically wasn't just about transforming, you know, te te technology space, but literally transforming human society, uh, human uh, interaction, human relationships, political relationships. You would not believe the rhetoric that was attached to the rise of the internet in that period. And um, we're talking about uh, the, the, the vision was for, uh, obliteration of international boundaries, wrecking of all hierarchy, this kind of almost transformation of the of the self. Um, there was this period of re euphoria and crowdsourcing was part of that. It was it goes by other names. It was called peer production and social production, but basically it was about people um, participating in a previously professionalized space. And all of that euphoria kind of had to be worked out and worked through. All the disappointments had to had to be encountered. Uh, there's some things, you know, there was predictions in my space that we wouldn't need newsrooms, we wouldn't need professional journalists, that people would basically, the communities would report on themselves, et cetera. Look, all that's all been washed out, but now we're kind of, now we're coming to a really interesting synthesis of, uh, of, where these actual tools are actually can be really powerful. Their, their limits, uh, you know, they don't have to change the world, but they can definitely, uh, you know, contribute to a, um, to a uh, far, <laughs> got a, sorry, bug on my, my computer. Uh, a, uh, we, we have a, uh, uh, you know, contribute to, to, you know, real advances in, um, in, in journalism and public understanding and, and, uh, and freedom of information. So, I think what we're going to do is, in fact, I know what we're going to do is um, is start off with two presentations um, by our speakers, who I'll introduce momentarily, and then um, I may have a few questions. But I was lamenting the um, the fact that we're not all together in the same room, but maybe we can try and preserve that spirit a little bit 
by you know encouraging everyone who has a question to 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 uh, to signal somehow if there's a way I don't know maybe in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and I'd be happy to call on you I don't think you should have to write them down but if you do ask a question do keep it brief because as you notice people can tend to dominate <laughs> dominate uh, space, the Zoom space which I really don't want to do okay so I'm going to um, uh, introduce our our, our panelists, uh, our two panelists. Um, this is uh, uh, on the website, but just in case you didn't read it, uh, Blanca Zoldi is a journalist from Direct 36, one of the most important uh, news organizations in Hungary, uh, an independent, um, independent uh, investigative organization of the absolute highest standards. I, I read that she was with, she was back, uh, back with Orgo before it was uh, basically uh, shuttered um, or transformed, shall we say by um, uh, in a kind of a, a move that's been very typical of the uh, of the uh, of the regime here where uh, the editors were were, were uh, ousted because it was too independent new new management was brought in the uh, the the real reporters walked out and formed and went to new new organizations including included forming direct 36 she's going to talk about um, the Direct 36's work in exposing corruption in um, in in the uh, uh, Hungarian government and the Orban Orban regime and in the in, in the connections to the or Orban family, the work that Direct 36 has been done. Our second speaker is uh, Baz van Beek, who is the co-founder and and freedom of information expert of Platform Authentique Journalistique. Uh, getting that right. And again, it's another one of these new, uh, which has done really amazing work in, uh, as you'll hear, in um, exposing connections between uh, uh, between the uh, the Dutch government and the um, uh, and the corporate sector, specifically uh, specifically the oil business. So, for, with so with that sort of introduction, uh, what am I missing about? Uh, he uh, just a, a bit more about Bazi studied conflict studies and human rights at University of Utrecht, active as an independent journalist during the uprising in Oaxaca, Mexico. And his last research brought him to Mozambique, where he began investigating the gas industry. So that's sort of where, where these two journalists are coming from. So what we'll do is we'll have a, a, a presentation from from Blanca, who's going to talk about this uh, FOIA effort, the Direct 36. Uh, engaged in. Um, we'll, I think we'll just shift straight over to Baz, who's going to talk about his efforts along, in, in terms of FOIA and how they try to incorporate crowdsourcing into the into the mix. And then I may have a couple of questions, but everyone should feel free to s signal that they'd like to speak and, and have everyone jump in. So with that, I turn it over to Blanca. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, Dean, for the introduction. I will quickly try to share my screen first. Can you see this well? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's good. I can still see a couple of faces among the audience. Uh, but, you know, if any of you that I don't see has any problems or I'm getting boring or I should skip something or explain something more than please raise your hand or shout or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, uh, as Dean said, I'm working uh, at Direct 36, uh, which is an investigative journalism center, a nonprofit, which was founded in 2015. And actually with the classical aims that you could hear from other investigative journalism center exposing corruption, exposing misuse of power, uh, misuse of public money, and generally just about writing, writing about things uh, that should be of public interest and of public knowledge, but somebody, mostly the powerful, would like to keep secret. And obviously this type of, of work requires um, a lot of time. Um, and we specialize in some long-term projects. Sometimes our projects are running through uh, months or even several years. And one of our longest term projects is actually uh, about the business of the Orban family. Uh, this project has been running for over three and a half years now. And um, I'm working on this together with my colleague and um, editor, Andreas Petu. 
and we are using various various reporting techniques along the way to to cover this uh, big topic but uh, freedom of information request and and actually a freedom of information lawsuit is is very um, important part of it uh, so i'm going to exactly talk about this like what kind of role it played in in our investigation so first about um, public information rules in hungary i have to say that theoretically according to law we have a uh, pretty good basis to actually learn about public information, learn about how public institutions function, everything connected uh, with their activities, and especially about how public money is spent, how taxpayers' money is spent in Hungary. But when we come to the practical side, um, then you would guess that this type of information, because of the law, should be available by a couple of clicks on a website, for example, but it's really much not the case. So what normally happens is that if we ask uh, a question from a public body, uh, then our questions, well, sometimes gets answered or um, get some answers, like partial answers, but most of the times what happens is that uh, we face a lot of obstacles. Um, it's a possible way to ask, actually ask for money uh to to provide the public data that we are asking for a lot of money so generally we don't want to pay that much uh or simply there are like a couple of excuses uh from the public bodies saying that they cannot provide the data uh, i won't go into details but when they actually deny uh your request there is a possibility to launch a public information lawsuit um, but you have to think very carefully whether you want to go into this like very honestly very tedious and annoying uh, task because this is something that the journalists cannot cannot do on on their own. Um, we are working together with um, lawyers. Luckily in Hungary there are lots of great lawyers who consider helping journalists to get public information uh, a very important task and they help us pro bono. Uh, but anyway, this takes a, a lot of time and resources from our side and from their side as well. Um, and on the other hand, as I mentioned, these uh, lawsuits can stretch on for, for many, many years. So in order to, to launch such a lawsuit, uh, we have to be conscious about the fact that, okay, this is a story that is important now, but it will be important in many years uh, if it takes that long to actually get the information because you would face sometimes a, a reality when well, the information is completely outdated when you, when you get it from, uh, from the public bodies. And because of all this, you have to know that you really want to get the information. Uh, and as a journalist, I can say that after the previous like partial victory in our Orban um, uh, lawsuit, I got the confirmation that I really, really wanted the information. This is, this is what you can see uh, when I got the boxes uh, in August containing the documents that we were fighting for. You can see how happy I was. So that's, that's a tick uh, in the boxes that I really wanted this information. But I will talk now about the, the previous two points. Uh, why is this story important, why it will be important in, in many years as well, and how we actually use the freedom of information uh, procedures to, to get the information. So about the story in a nutshell, um, as you might know, our Prime Minister is really poor because according to his asset declaration, he has hardly any money uh, and savings on his bank accounts, but magically over the past years, his family and friends have become like incredibly rich uh, during this time also um, thanks to different public projects that they were participating in uh, so to say they're getting rich on on taxpayers money and there are two ways actually for them to to do this it's either a visible participation in public projects or a little bit more like a hidden participation in these projects and i will explain this what what i mean by this so you have to understand actually uh, what is the main debate here? Um, because if we talk about public projects, for example, a highway construction, it starts out uh, by the state or the state-owned company who wants to give some money to, to do a certain thing. And then they organize a, a tendering competition 
and they give money to, to the main contractors that are winning these tenders. Actually, in Hungary, this is a completely transparent procedure. You go online and you, you look at the different tenders and you can see uh, which companies won the tenders and how much money they are going to get to actually uh, do the job that they were um, asked to do. But after this, actually, these contractors normally don't do the job on their own, but they actually contract uh, other companies to help them. Uh, they get into a relationship with subcontractors and the subcontractors do some part of their job. Uh, the money trickles down to, to new companies which are not that visible already um, in public documentation. There are certain rules that above X percent of, of the whole money uh, that they receive from the tender, they have to publish the names of the companies. But here there is already a possibility uh, to hide some of the participants of, of the public projects. Um, and if we go one level lower, uh, actually you have to uh, think about that even these subcontractors will uh, work together with, uh, with other companies. For example, suppliers of building materials. So, for example, if we stay at the highway example, those companies that deliver the stones and the cement and these kind of things uh, for, for a highway, these participate at this very low level, which is absolutely not visible in any type of public documentation. So when we come back to, uh, to the Orban family's participation in public projects, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have heard um, about uh, this guy who is the son-in-law of, of Viktor Orban, Istvan Tibor, who has um, been involved in different public lighting projects in, in Hungary, financed by the European Union, which caused um, well, a really big problem because even Olaf started to investigate these projects because they, uh, they were won in a very questionable way. The tenders were basically tailor-made for the, for the company of, of this guy. Uh, and why do we know this? Um, because the company uh, that was used to uh, be owned by, by the son-in-law of Orban participated in these state projects as, as a main contractor. So if you put it in like any type of database, you would see the company's name. So that was quite a straightforward thing to, to learn about. But if we go to other family members, uh, who you can see on this picture is, uh, is the um, uh, father of the Prime Minister, uh, Jesu Orban. He is actually uh, a businessman since, uh, since the 90s. He owns uh, a mine in a small village in Hungary, actually quite close to the, to the hometown of the Prime Minister. And the mine, um, well, it produces uh, different types of, of stones and, um, and other materials, for example, um, concrete elements that can be used for, for several different types of infrastructure projects. So it's a perfect candidate to actually be a supplier for different infrastructure projects as, as a supplier of building materials. And this is exactly what uh, Orban's father is doing but you can see that he is at the very lowest level of this supply chain, basically, and this gives him the possibility to, to do all this business in a relatively hidden way. Um, so why is this story important? Why is it, why is it a problem if, if the prime minister's father is, is getting public money from, from public projects? Um, well, the first thing is that uh, what we hear from, uh, from competitors, for example, that it's a, it's a very questionable thing in terms of competition because, um, because there, there are actually gossips saying that there are a couple of infrastructure projects which are kind of already aimed uh, at the prime minister's father. So some, some companies wouldn't even enter the competition because it's already known who is going to, to be the supplier of the building materials, um, which is Orban's company. Um, and on the other hand, it's also questionable whether it's a good business for the state as such, uh, because although um, people say that Orban's company, uh, the father's company are supplying materials uh, that are of good quality, they are also 30% or more uh, expensive than the competition's material. So that can be problematic as well. Another thing is that uh, even Orban himself used to oppose this, oppose his father's involvement in, uh, in infrastructure projects. Back in 2001, he actually asked explicitly his father 
uh, not to do business with the state, do his private business, but not with the state. Um, and actually, when we started to dig into this story uh, in 2017, I, I had the chance to confront Orban uh, with this change in the attitude, like, okay, what happened? Now it's all right that your father is, is being involved in, in different state projects. And actually he said that his attitude hasn't changed. So he still doesn't want his father to be directly involved with the state, but he kind of elegantly went around my question uh, and not to, he didn't mention that actually in the lower levels, well, yes, he is participating in the public projects. And looking a little bit beyond Hungary, um, I'm quite convinced that this type of, uh, of transparency problem actually highlights a more wider European level problem. Um, because actually these infrastructure projects in Hungary are mostly financed from, from European Union funds. Uh, and you can see that this is a perfect opportunity uh, for, for companies just to get inserted into the level of this supply chain in a way that, uh, that where the money goes can remain completely hidden from, from the public eye. So how do we get this um, hidden information? Um, this is our big task as journalists. So we first heard about this um, from, from different sources in the, in the industry. Uh, and we got a lot of people talking about it, but it was only gossips. So we actually had to find proof of the, of the involvement of, of the prime minister's family in, in these projects. Um, so what we did as, as a first step was actually to, to go to the mine and start following the trucks that are coming out from the mine and to see where, where they're de delivering uh, materials for, for ongoing construction projects. Uh, and also we went to, to like several uh, ongoing project sites. And actually here, I think on the picture, I was hiding behind some bushes next to a power plant where, uh, where the trucks were delivering uh, stones. And that was already approved that I could take a picture of, of the logo of the truck that was coming from, from Orban's mine. So that was a good beginning. But then we also wanted to, to get some information uh, on paper actually about um, about these, uh, these projects, because it's not enough for us just to know that, okay, they were involved in some projects, but we want to know actually how much material they supplied for the projects and how much money they got from this. And this picture was actually taken um, at a railway construction next to the Lake Balaton, where I used to bike a lot of times when the construction was going on. And I was asking the people who were working there whether they know from where they are supplying the stones uh, for, um, for the construction. And many people were saying that, yeah, it's coming from the Orban mine. So I already had quite a good like oral confirmation for it. Uh, but then I uh, wanted to also uh, con contact actually the project uh, management uh, the state company that was responsible for the project, just simply asking, um, like, hey, can you please actually give me the list of companies that supplied building materials for, for the project? And first, they were super helpful saying that, yeah, 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 sure, it's okay, we understand your question, but the thing is that we have like a lot of uh, companies that supply materials for this huge project, it's a several billion euro project. Uh, could you please make your request a little bit uh, narrower. So what type of building materials are you specifically interested in? And then I said that I'm interested in the crushed stones that are being delivered for, um, for the project. And magically they were like, oh no, okay, we cannot give you that information. So that was a really funny um, piece of, uh, of experience actually. But here we, we realize that, okay, we just cannot go with like simple journalistic questions. Uh, we need to launch a public, public information uh, lawsuit to get this type of information. Actually, obviously we started with a public information request that was denied. Um, we, we asked the National Infrastructure Development Company, which is responsible for all types of development projects in Hungary connected to highway and railway constructions. Um, we asked them about not only the Balaton uh, railway construction, but five other uh, very big constructions that were going on in the country in the past couple of years. We worked together with, as I mentioned, the pro bono uh, lawyers. We worked together with the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union um, to get some legal support. 
uh, and our main aim was to get information both about the subcontractors of, of these projects and also about the supplier of building materials. So that was very important. And to know how much and for how much money um, they actually supply materials. And then you have to imagine that when you launch a public information lawsuit, this is a very boring thing, honestly, because for, for many months, nothing is happening. You're just basically waiting in the office, working on other stories. And, and every other month, for example, there is a, uh, something um, coming from the court saying that you have to submit a legal document, then you sit together with the lawyers and you submit the legal document and then wait another two or three months for actually anything to, to happen. Um, so the first leg of, uh, of our public information lawsuit was, uh, was from August to December in 2017, um, where we actually had quite a surprising victory and the court of, of first instance in Budapest, uh, the main debate was going on about whether um, the data on uh, suppliers, the suppliers of building materials is public or not, or is it already a business secret, a trade secret? And obviously we as journalists are arguing that <clears throat> well, it doesn't matter how many, how many levels you have where the public money trickles down, this is still public money, it doesn't change its nature or, or whatever. So we, we are convinced that, uh, that we should get also the, the information on the suppliers. <clears throat> I think the court was not so convinced about this, but in the end, uh, they still wrote that, well, the, um, the state company has to, has to provide information both on the subcontractors sub sub and on the suppliers. And they did so uh, partially. So what they did in, in January 2018 was to uh, send me a link uh, to a kind of uh, website where they actually uploaded all the list of, of subcontractors that were involved in these um, six projects, which was already great because even uh, on the subcontractor level, uh, especially at the Balaton project, we already found one of the companies that were connected to the Orban family. So we could already publish an article, which was great. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what they completely ignored from, from the court's ruling was the list about the, uh, about the suppliers of building materials. So we said that, well, okay, we, we have already a victory at court. Uh, the, the state company didn't appeal, but we still didn't get the data. So what do you do then? Because normally if you, if you have a court decision um, of, of such nature, um, you know, you have to get the data. Uh, so what can you do? We actually decided to launch a litigation which is a little bit of a weird thing at, uh, at hearing this at the first time, I guess, because normally you would launch a litigation if somebody is, is owing you money uh, and not information. But in this case, actually, uh, the company was owing us information and we, and we wanted to get that. So we went into this like other level of, uh, of the public information lawsuit, actually after the public information lawsuit to fight for the data that the court already ordered to give us, but we didn't receive it. And this went on for, for a really long time. We didn't hear back anything from, from the company until 2019, when we actually got an, an on-site litigation procedure, which actually meant that we um, went with my lawyer and the litigator to the site of the National Infrastructure Development Company, I mean, the headquarters, and I couldn't really believe what, what, what is going to happen. Are we going to confiscate computers or, or what? I just, couldn't, I just couldn't imagine it. But in the end, it was a lot more boring than that. So we actually sat in, the, in a little small room um, and, uh, and the staff of this uh, company gave me again the very same list of subcontractors that we already received from them. But now it was not online, but actually printed in two copies. So I was like, okay, I already got this. I don't need this. You know exactly what I need. And they were like, yes, we very much know what you need because we have been reading your articles about the Orban family, but you should understand that we need to discuss this with, with, our, um, with our superiors, how we can go about it, but we will do everything but what we can to actually provide you the data. 
And funny thing, in one week also my parents received a box uh, with like little like Hungarian flag colored ribbons, ribbons on it from the Hungarian post. Uh, the national infrastructure company just sent the very same uh, data of subcontractors again to them as well, just to be sure. But anyway, um, the procedure was going on. And again, we didn't hear anything from the company for, for more than a year until this August when on a Friday I just received a, a phone call from, from, from an unknown number saying that, hey, so are you the one who wants the data about these projects? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said that, uh, well, the thing is that we have 28 boxes. So please tell us where we can deliver it with, with our delivery service from, from the company. And I was super happy. Uh, and the next Monday, the boxes actually arrived. So that was um, a very big uh, happiness for me. But already after we started to look into the documents, I realized that uh, well, this is a, a really wide overview over, over the dis different projects, but it only contains partial information um, about the suppliers. Uh, meaning that there are a couple of uh, documents in it that actually show that yes some of the oil bank companies were involved in uh, in the project but actually our answers um, our questions were not answered about the quantity of the building materials supplied and how much uh, the state was paying for this so what i can say is that yes we are going on uh, with this procedure uh, but that's again i guess like several several months of waiting still for us to to get more data but in the meantime we obviously started processing what we have these boxes and actually we made a short video of this but it's in hungarian so i will just play the video so that you can have an idea about how our our office looks and stuff and i will give myself a voiceover <laughs> So what you can see is that uh, we started to, to pack around these boxes and then dig into them. Uh, and we started to actually look through the documents manually with the help of my colleagues. And it was really interesting because already looking through them manually um, bore some fruit actually because we could write a couple of articles showing that all advanced companies were involved in different new infrastructure projects. So we had uh, new evidence. Uh, but the thing is that here is like 100,000 documents that we are talking about. <clears throat> so we were quite sure that we want to want to make these documents a little bit more digestible for, for ourselves and for, for everybody else as well. So we actually got uh, this printer, which is quite an industrial, industrial printer and scanner. And actually we could scan all the documents. Um, so what we have now is that we have all the documents digitalized and we, we have already ran through them an OCR, an optical character recognition, which actually helps us uh, to, to make these documents searchable. So what we have now is, is a more user-friendly database of these uh, documents. So I'm, uh, I'm actually expecting to, to discover some more stories in them. So, so far, this is like a partial happy ending, but I hope that this project is, is going on for, for a lot longer as well. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Blanca. This is great. Uh, thanks for that interesting presentation and for sticking to the time. The only thing I'm sad about is that you had to have a whole slide on why public corruption is important. <laughs> All right, we can, we'll worry about that in the question period. But it's, it says something about the state of play that we have to explain this, but okay. Let's get over to Buzz because, um, uh, because uh, I want to keep things on schedule. And if we could, you know, keep it to 20 minutes, we'll have a little time for, um, for some discussion. So over to you, Buzz. Uh, yeah, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, Blanca, what an amazing presentation and the investigation. And uh, thank you, CEU, for hosting this uh, together with Dean. Um, I also made a uh, little presentation. Uh, two seconds. Um, so yeah, uh, the shell papers. Um, I hope everybody could see this. Not yet, I think. There you go, share screen. 
at advanced level zoom out. always eh? <laughs> always troubles 2020 um there we go can everybody see this yes perfect um the shell papers uh well first a, a short introduction um uh, this is my uh, my small team the platform uh, of authentic journalism um we are a dutch uh, journalist collective uh, we started seven years ago and we mainly specialize in investigate the investigating Dutch uh, multinationals and their relation with the Dutch government. Um, and we use uh, the freedom of information law in almost every in investigation that we do. My colleagues here are Jillis Mast, uh, Merel de Buck and uh, Alexander Beunder. Um, in this project, this shell paper project, we work extensively with uh, Roger Vleugels. Uh, he is not a lawyer, but he is a freedom of, uh, of information expert in the Netherlands did more than uh, 7,500 uh, FOIA procedures. And uh, uh, he's just, uh, he's living and breeding uh, the Dutch FOIA. So he's great to have on our side. Um, well, just in short, where this, this uh, idea for this investigation came from, uh, like I said, we, we did many uh, investigations uh, into uh, Dutch multinationals and, uh, and their relation with the Dutch state. And in almost all of these investigations, we saw that there was uh, a very strong and successful lobby of Royal Dutch Shell, the oil and gas company, uh, which, is, uh, which is partially Dutch and partially English. Uh, we saw this in the liquefied natural gas. Um, they were successfully lobbying. Uh, they're, they're part of uh, several uh, public-private dialogues. And uh, in Mozambique, they were uh, really working together with the English government to push the Mozambican uh, government to, to give them some gas tenders. Uh, you could actually see in the FOIA that they were saying the pressure must come from all sides. Uh, so there was this really aggressive lobbying and the Dutch uh, state and, the, and the, uh, the United Kingdom were, were actively helping uh, to get them what they need. Um, but there were also some other, um, uh, th this idea also came from some other people, uh, mainly the, the book from Steve Cole. Uh, he looked into uh, how ExxonMobil uh, was working together with the American government and our own Dutch journalist Marcel Metze, which is uh, one of the, our most famous uh, corporate historians and journalists, he, he found out in the WikiLeaks files that um, the Dutch state and Shell are continually uh, borrowing employees from each other. You could call it an internship. This goes both ways. So we got uh, Dutch uh, statesmen going to work for Shell for uh, some time and the other way around. And uh, the Americans also noticed this. You could find this in the WikiLeaks files. So uh, during their negotiations with uh, Iran, during one of the sanctions, that they, yeah, they found out they were not uh, only sitting across uh, some Dutch statements, but also uh, Shell, who were doing an internship. Our own Minister of Foreign Affairs, Uri Rosenthal, actually said that, that, that this, is, this is needed. These Western oil companies are simply dependent on the support of their government to secure their position abroad. So this, there's this kind of unique position that gas and oil companies have. And he, he basically means that uh, th they are working against uh, companies from Russia, from Saudi Arabia, from the Middle East, and they get support from their state. Uh, so Western oil companies should receive the same, um, which is quite problematic. But there are plenty of other reasons. Um, the historical relationship between the Dutch government and Royal Dutch Shell goes, uh, goes back a long way. Um, actually, uh, as far as 1900, um, the first uh, oil drillings were done in the, the colonies of Indonesia. Uh, it was then still uh, just royal oil. Uh, later, they, they went together with a British company, Shell, and it became Royal Dutch Shell. Um, but that's not the only controversies. Uh, Shell uh, has many uh, um, tax rulings with the Dutch government, so they, they have their own tax systems that are completely secret, that we, uh, we, we never found out uh, how it looks or how it functions. 
well, Mozambique, as I already uh, talked about. And then there's this environmental uh, question, of course. Shell has been very active uh, in anti-climate uh, lobbying. And there's a lot of civil unrest in, in the north of Holland, uh, in Groningen, uh, which, I would, uh, which I will talk a little bit uh, later about. Um, so, okay, we were thinking how we're going to do this for you. And we decided that we're going to do 17 um, gigantic uh, freedom of information requests. And um, just as uh, Blanca already explained, we also have a very simple uh, FOIA law. Uh, that means that in 28 days, you should get an answer. Uh, you should actually get your documents. And 28 days later, you, uh, uh, they can extend it with 28 more days. So 56 days total, the government should answer. Uh, in this case, this of course completely different because we ask a lot, but even in the, in the most small uh, FOIA, um, the Dutch government will never make it on time. Uh, this is lately becoming already six months, seven months, and a year is, uh, is actually more realistic for even the most small amount of documents. So um, Dutch journalists are continually uh, complaining about this. Uh, um, there's a lot of uh, writing about this in the newspapers, but nothing has been done so far. Um, and we decided that we might need the help of the public uh, um, to help our case. So we, we were thinking about creating a, a dashboard which uh, visitors could follow and they could follow the legal procedures. So basically, how are the legal procedures going uh, every step along the way? I will tell a little bit further on. But first, what was inside this envelope? So normally a FOIA request in the Netherlands is actually basically very simple. It's only one piece of paper. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in a few larger requests, uh, you have two sets of paper, but uh, this was uh, a huge package. So um, we listed everything uh, extensively because Shell is a huge company. Uh, there were over 1500 entities of Shell so we listed all of them because we also filed a FOIA request at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But we also came up with a list of the lobbyists, the lobby groups that they're working with, the PR firms that they're mostly working with. These were gigantic Excel sheets and they were mostly set up actually to help the Dutch government finding the materials. So it was kind of like an extra service that we were providing them to say, if you want to really look into Shell, these are the entities you need to look for. And also because it was, of course, not a, a normal request by any means, we, we basically said we're open to discuss how we proceed further. So you can use the first 56 days only to set up a meeting with us and to come to a workable plan of action. So if we can come to agreements that these documents would actually come our way, and then we're talking about maybe six months or a year or even further, the, depends of course on the government body and the amount of documents, then we're always willing to discuss it. So use the first 56 days to come up with a plan. Well, mm. so basically this FOIA request uh, was all documents regarding or by Shell since 2005. Uh, and that's what we call the Shell papers. So um, we asked the ministries that we, uh, we found out had to, uh, the, the most strong relationship with, with Royal Dutch Shell. So, uh, of course, uh, the Ministry of Finance because of these tax rulings, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they're cooperating with Shell in different uh, parts of the world to get, for example, gas standards in, in Mozambique. Um, but also the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science because Shell is actively working on some uh, new education plans to get more uh, Dutch students interested in working in the gas sector. Um, we also did this on a more local level, the provinces uh, uh, and, and some municipalities. So some of these municipalities are, are really logical. Uh, and the city of Rotterdam uh, is the, the harbor of, uh, of the Netherlands and uh, houses a few of uh, Shell biggest uh, factories. Um, and in the north, uh, Shell is uh, uh, in cooperation with ExxonMobil is, is, is drilling uh, for gas uh, already since the 1960s and a lot of the areas there are completely affected by earthquakes. Um, again, I will talk a little bit further about that. 
So this dashboard actually had a few functions in our mind. So um, as Blanca says, uh, um, already said, normally as a journalist, this is a very closed off procedure. You're just sitting there with a lawyer and sometimes you have some government officials uh, across the table, but uh, it's, it's very closed off. Uh, the, the public never finds out about it and it's actually a process that you uh, as a journalist are completely involved in. Maybe you tell your friends over a nice beer uh, in the bar, but uh, a lot of things are going on between these procedures and we thought it might be good to share this. And this dashboard had these four elements. So first we saw it as a method of acceleration of the FOIA procedures by keeping the government officials in the spotlight making sure that the public can follow these procedures uh, every step along the way, from every phone call to every email. Um, it might keep them in check to uphold the law, uh, something that we didn't see in most of our normal FOIA procedures anymore. Involvement, we would involve this reader, uh, the readers um, from the beginning of our research until the final results. So you don't dump this huge investigation uh, on them in the end. Information magnets, uh, people would, if they get involved and they might have some information, might actually come forward, uh, especially because they see uh, how hard it is to, to, to get this information by the regular FOIA means. And um, by informing the reader about all these FOIA procedures to, to show how it works, to show how, how uh, they could also use FOIA in their own way to show that the normal obstructions that we face, because um, this might be a nice little detail, uh, Dutch government officials are actually trained in how to use obstruction to stop this FOIA. They get trained by uh, uh, ex expensive lawyers in how to withhold this uh, information request. So this might actually help, uh, it became actually a very difficult procedure for uh, someone who's not involved in, in, in a daily matter. So we might share some of this knowledge. Well, here we see Roger actually drawing the very first dashboard and next to it is, uh, is our more uh, professional drawing. Um, it was actually basically very simple. We're gonna show how much time every uh, step takes and we're gonna uh, use it as a diary to show um, every department of every government, what steps are being taken by us and by them. So uh, we, we went from drawing to, uh, to the, the FOIA dashboard here. So on the left, you can see we, uh, it's, it's in Dutch, but um, on top of there, you can see uh, appeal. Uh, so in first request, appeal, uh, higher appeal and, uh, and so on. And you can see with every uh, government how long they're uh, taking about this. And next to that, you could read the diary of every step we, uh, we take and uh, the, the government takes. You can also see what we asked every government body specifically, because of course, uh, we also state that these are probably uh, your departments that have uh, extensive uh, cooperation with Shell. So you should uh, especially look into these two departments. So we shared all this knowledge from the get-go. Well, we, uh, we didn't do this alone, of course. We are working with our publisher, Follow the Money, who edits and publishes our articles and is also our main funder. We're also uh, funded by the Foundation of Democracy and Media and uh, Lobby Watch. And we uh, gathered a board of recommendations, uh, uh, mainly uh, Dutch professors. Uh, in the middle here, you see Jan van der Streek, who is uh, investigating uh, the Dutch, uh, the, the tax deals that Shell uh, made with the Dutch government. On the left, uh, Saskia Sasse, uh, uh, professor in the States. And on the right, Naomi Klein, who also joined our board of recommendations, probably all well known by you. Well. So we mailed this FOIA request. Uh, this is, uh, I'm just warning you, this is not gonna be as a happy ending yet as, uh, as Blanca's story, but we're still in the middle of it. So yeah, uh, last April 2019, we mailed this FOIA request. Here on the left, you can see these envelopes ready. We gathered mass media attention, but from the government, nothing but silence, which kind of made us uh, worried because we, yeah, we said you can use the first 56 days to at least talk to us and come up with a good plan. 
But finally, we got a response. The Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. It's actually the, the ministry that has the most contacts with, uh, with Shell. And we, we would have a meeting on the first, first, 4th of June. Um, and the ministry, for the longest time, basically said, uh, you're just going to be talking with us. And uh, uh, on a, the day before the meeting, we were extremely worried that all these other ministries uh, either didn't get our envelopes, which they did. Um, but uh, suddenly the ministry said there were would actually talk on behalf of all the other 16 uh, um, government bodies, uh, including them at Woodmax 17. Um, so during this meeting, uh, we discovered that even that was not true because the municipality of Asse, a small uh, uh, city in the north of Holland, wasn't there. And basically they, they came in with the first demand. You're going to reduce these documents to only the official documents. So these are documents signed by either the minister or mayor or uh, uh, high government officials and most of the time already public. You're going to reduce these uh, 1,590 shell entities to three and you're going to reduce these government subsidiaries to two. It basically came down to a reduction of 90% for us completely unacceptable. So we denied this request. And then it kind of started to crack. Um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs basically thought we're going to uphold this, uh, this coalition. We're going to uphold this first demand and we're going to come through this. But uh, like I said, the, the municipality of Asse was already uh, was not involved. And the first telephone call from the, the municipality was, we're going to work with you and uh, we're going to uphold this request. And just a little bit of context uh, here on the left, you can see uh, where the, the, the gas uh, is actually located in the Netherlands. So most of the drilling since 1960 is being done in the north of Holland, made Holland very, very rich. Um, but since, uh, especially 2014, there have been more and more earthquakes in this region. Uh, so the, the public is very much against this drilling of, uh, of Shell and Exxon uh, Mobile. Uh, it's, it keeps continuing um, and now they want, to, uh, they want to close it off, but uh, earthquakes are uh, still very much uh, occurring. Um, so, um, Asse, one of these northern cities, uh, this was one probably a reason why they wanted to uphold this information request because for their citizens, it's very important. So one of our sources uh, told us that the Ministry of Economic Affairs went to the other three northern uh, uh, government bodies and basically said, this is not gonna happen. We don't want to see in the newspaper that the North is, uh, is choosing their own way in this FOIA procedure. So you're just going to stand in line and you're going to do what we say. Well, um, all the other government, uh, northern government bodies, at least two of them in this stage, uh, uh, also said we're going to uphold this information request. And, and a few days later, the first uh, um, uh, northern news uh, magazines uh, and websites were showing exactly that story. The North is choosing their own way. So for us, this was a major victory against the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, and it might be nice to note that also our sources in the north and in the ministries uh, said that the dashboard was actually helping with this. So that there were, uh, this transparency was actually, uh, was very helpful. Uh, it also has very negative sides, I will come to that. So our method in the north, um, uh, that we had a good cooperation with these, uh, for now, three northern uh, government bodies. Uh, the fourth was still uh, with the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, it didn't mean that they uh, were happy to do this gigantic FOIA request. Uh, um, the, the deplorable state of archives in the Netherlands is, uh, is, is everywhere, um, which is just a problem. After uh, the digital world came in, um, it's become harder and harder for government bodies, uh, especially with uh, cutbacks. To, to have a good management of uh, documents. Uh, in the North, this was not, uh, was not different. But we basically said, if you come with a subject list or a document list um, of all the documents that you have uh, concerning Shell, then we will just make a selections of the ones that we are interested in. Uh, this can be to confidential access, 
or you can send these documents list and we, we just, uh, what we call the traffic light system. We choose either with uh, the color green, we want this document, the color red, we are not interested in this document or the color orange uh, from the document title, we cannot say um, uh, what this document is about. Please give us some more information. Um, and we kept doing this and with more and more success. For example, the province of Groningen found more than 250,000 documents, but by working together with their computer department and using this documents list, we could narrow down uh, more and more. So now we're narrowed down with the province of Groningen to around 40,000 40, documents. But the dashboard goes two ways. Uh, Shell uh, also found out about this dashboard and they hired uh, the, the very expensive law firm Van der Velds uh, in The Hague and um, Van der Velds was actually using uh, the dashboard to contact the northern government bodies saying that uh, these lists should not be shared uh, because it might, might already uh, contain um, uh, information that they don't want, uh, want us to have. So it should already be redacted. Um, the, the northern government bodies didn't do this yet, but you can see this, this dashboard has its uh, positive uh, way and uh, also a lot of uh, negative ways. Um, so the northern uh, government bodies actually asked, uh, can you please stop uh, updating this dashboard uh, every, uh, every day? Because uh, maybe it's better to have a little break in between so we can finish uh, we can actually help you uh, with uh, gathering the documents. So uh, that's when we stopped updating the dashboard uh, every single day. Uh, so you can see we already, there's not full transparency anymore or at least belated transparency. But the ministry also didn't sit still. So they came with their second demand and the ministry decided they wanted to be our editor. So they said, you know what? Um, Clearly, you don't know uh, what you need for your investigation. So if you can send us your, uh, your, uh, uh, your um, investigation plan um, to us, then we can decide what documents you need to finish it, which was completely hilarious, of course. And um, the journalist collectives in the Netherlands uh, uh, actually thought this was a very da dangerous precedent. So it was also put on their website as this, the Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, doesn't uh, uphold the FOIA law and now they're asking journalists for their research plans, which, which is actually completely crazy if you think about it. You, the Dutch law states that you never ever have to give a reasoning for your FOIA law, uh, for your FOIA request. So, uh, and this becomes of course extra dangerous when you ask uh, um, Dutch journalists to do this. Uh, this is also what we responded. So we basically came to the ministry and said again, we would love uh, uh, to talk to you and to uh, use document lists or uh, um, uh, some access to uh, confidential access to these documents to make this request smaller and workable for you. But we, we only want to do this uh, knowing actually what you have. We don't want to lessen our requests uh, based on that you say, ah, oh, it's so much, we cannot handle it. Um, so then they decided to come with a last and final demand. And now it becomes really legal. Uh, they, they basically demanded that uh, administrative matters are too broad. So the Dutch FOIA law states that you have to uh, specify the administrative matters that your FOIA request falls under. Basically, that means um, that if you file a request under a government body, it's, it should fall under their government tasks. So you cannot ask the Ministry of Defense about um, uh, the, the new education law. You should file requests concerning either weapons, uh, weapon lobbying or uh, etc. Um, this never happened before. Um, and so the ministry basically said that a company such as Shell is not an administrative matter. We actually stated a lot of administrative matters, but these were too broad, which came as a complete surprise because we use these administrative matters uh, like the correct use of public funds in almost every request. And more than that, 
even if we would specify these administrative matters, it wouldn't help the ministries or the other government bodies to look for these documents. You look by typing in shell into your file system and not these administrative matters. So basically it was their legal loophole to uh, deny this request. So then came the sad news. On the 2nd of December 2020, uh, 13 government bodies decided to deny our shell papers request. Hey, Bass, I'm going to give a, a two minute warning because I sense there's going to be a lot of questions because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested in, keep it in this and I uh, want to make sure that people have a chance to, to talk to you. So go ahead. Right, Dean. Let's do it. Um, so now you might think 13. Yes, the last uh, after that uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and their coalition denied uh, our, our request, the last northern government body, the province of Durante, actually joined us. So it was a little bit of a success. Do we just give up? No, never. Um, we filed a FOIA concerning our FOIA. So we want all the documents concerning our FOIA request. Now it becomes really meta. We got 2000 pages. One of the first things we read, is it wise to stop lending out officials to Shell because of this request by the HR director of the Ministry of Economic Affairs? Um, but it also showed that we were setting up to fail. The Ministry of Economic Affairs used the first two months to set up a coalition. It was based on the ministries with the most documents. They were, became the core group, Economic Affairs, Finance and the Ministry of in Infrastructure. They were always in possession of detailed document lists concerning the request, but they never wanted to share it with us. And they worked extensively with our nation's top law, law firm to come up with this legal loophole that I just described to you about this administrative affairs. But meanwhile, um, it's actually helping because uh, uh, people came forward with a lot of information from eternal shell documents to old historical uh, um, books concerning shell lobby groups. And our most, uh, uh, the best tip we got was about uh, one of uh, the most famous Dutch professors, uh, Fritz Butcher, who in the, 90, uh, who in the 1980s were, was funded by shell uh, to basically say that, that uh, was uh, anti was funded to to say that climate uh, uh, the climate hysteria as he described it himself um, was basically not necessary it was climate denial uh, in its most purest form uh, we also had our first objection hearing um, and already you can see that in this objection hearing a lot of questions were asked about uh, this administ administrative matter and it was actually sent back to uh, the lawyers of the ministry um, so we have a good chance that this is not going to be uphold. And now the city of Asse is the first one that's uh, ready with the documents. We are preparing for the first docs uh, that are coming in, 2,000 documents. And we, are, um, we actually want to keep the public involved. So we are working with Indica and Document Cloud to uh, analyze these documents and by making sure that the public can help by... Um, by showing us which documents are necessary uh, that we really should look into. Uh, these are the first things that we just created this yesterday. Uh, we are creating some badges on the site that if people help by uh, uh, checking these documents. Uh, if you have one document, you get one badge and 10 later on. So this is very much in a beta phase, but we are preparing. But we also, this week, we had the news that the Ministry of Economic Affairs is now trying to stop the city of us to publish uh, any documents because they are not doing it, so neither should the municipalities. Um, uh, and we're trying to fight that right now. So I'm going to end on that. Well done. Thank you very much. So uh, if, if we had applause emoji, thank you to both of you. Um, I'm going to recommend that I think the best thing to do if anyone has a question is to, I don't know, wave your hand or put, or put a note in the chat. Um, and I'll ask a question uh, to get us started and then um, anyone can jump in or not. I, look, I understand it's the Zoom thing is a, is a bit awkward. Uh, this is for both panelists, but um, it occurs to me, um, I'm a, I'm a, a resident of Hungary, uh, but not a citizen, and and uh, and uh, I'm curious about uh, 
you know, FOIA really depends on the rule of law and, and its proper functioning in a, in a, in a democracy. And um, Blanca, the stereotype about, um, about Hungary is that it's effectively collapsed. Whereas uh, Bas, the stereotype of, of the Netherlands is, you know, it's, you know, first world and runs with uh, like a fine, like a Swiss watch, so to speak, or a Dutch chocolate, I don't know, but it runs well. And, and uh, can you both speak to that, um, uh, that, that thing? Because it sounds like um, it's not as clear cut and dried as it, as it appears, particularly in the lower courts, uh, Blanca. Can you talk about rule of law in Hungary briefly? And, and then Baz, you, you also briefly address uh, FOIA and the rule of law in, in, in the Netherlands. Well, um... Yes, rule of law in Hungary. I mean, you can hear so many people complaining about it all the time. So now I wouldn't like to be one of them because I would like to give a little bit of a more optimistic overview, um, especially uh, in terms of FOIA requests. So yes, obviously it's difficult. Obviously it could have been uh, a lot easier, um, but also journalists can be a little bit more hardworking as well. I mean, in general, not to not to be like, um, you know, just completely discouraged by the by the first challenges. So it's really easy to say that, well, yeah, you know, Hungarian democracy has collapsed, so it's actually not even worse to contact ministries to get information. But honestly, even at ministries, what I find, uh, there are just, you know, human beings sitting like in front of their computers or next to their telephones and and sometimes they just don't understand your question like what kind of data you're really looking for or really they they have the will to help you but they don't have the data in that format that you that you need it so honestly i think it's always good to you know try to have a little bit of a human human interaction with the humans that are working in the state institutions as well. So we had quite some positive examples as well, saying that, well, you know, we, dis we rejected your, your request because actually just one portion of the data that you were asking for is just way too much work for us to, to get. And then the other part of the data they could actually give out quite, quite easily after, after a little bit of consultation. Same goes uh, for, for the court system in Hungary. Um, what we see is once you, you decide to launch a public information request, you can actually trust that the, the courts, especially actually in, um, in the capital, they are quite pro-transparency still. Um, so we have this like basic practice that in case an institution wants to ask for money to actually provide the information that you're asking for, it's quite a good idea to launch a, a public uh, information lawsuit because normally courts would tell at the end that, well, look, this is a huge public company, state company that you're asking uh, the data from, they must have the resources to actually provide this data to you. And in the end, after a couple of months, you can just scrap basically uh, that type of cost that they were asking from you. So these are a couple of encouraging points, apart from all the horrible stuff that we can say about Hungary. So, so you're, you're, it's not the case that someone, a judge sees your FOIA suit and calls the prime minister's office to find out what to do. Well, I mean, honestly, I don't know what's going behind the scenes, but uh, honestly, my personal experience, for example, um, with this court case, I, I attended quite a lot of hearings uh, myself with my lawyer and the lawyer of the national infrastructure company. And Honestly, um, everybody seemed a little bit confused because this was something new. I think nobody really asked for, you know, this level of, uh, of data about the supplier of building materials. And the judge really tried to understand what we are saying and how the other lawyer is arguing. And then we were looking through actually the, uh, the text of the law, which is applicable here. Uh, so I felt more like, uh, you know, let's, let's move forward with this uh, and let's try to, to find a good solution. 
On the other hand, yes, there are instances when, for example, I'm running now a lawsuit also against the company of, uh, of Lorenz Mesaros, who is now one of the richest men in, in the country and a good friend of Viktor Orban and um, big oligarch. Also, I'm sure it was just luck and hard work. Yes, exactly. Uh, but he is also very secretive about um, all the different types of, you know, Orban's involvement in his own projects. So we started a lawsuit against that as well. And there we actually see that um, that the court case is going like really, really slowly. And we just had a, uh, an occasion when, when we were like, okay, so what is happening with our court case? And it turned out that there was already a, a new step done, but a uh, countryside court just forgot to actually tell us that we should have submitted uh, the next document for the court case. So, um, there are things obviously going behind the doors that, that I cannot see, but uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, actually for me it was a super surprising experience to receive, for example, this vast amount of documentation. I would have never expected to, to reach this right. point, but honestly, when looking through the boxes, you know, I, I saw a couple of post-its written by the employer, employees, I guess, from this public company saying that, you should begin reading here or something like that when the documents are a little bit messy. So, you know, I wouldn't say that uh, they're like horrible people or whatever who just, you know, definitely want to hide information. That's great. And that, that's like, actually, it also kind of upholds uh, this old journalistic maxim, which is basically, if you're in doubt, you make the call, you make the request, you always ask, you know, you, something, nothing bad can happen from asking. Bas, can you quickly uh, uh, address this issue of uh, uh, relative strength of rule of law? And I, 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 I hope, uh, hope it's safe to assume that courts are remain independent from from the government, more or less. Um, uh, yeah, the, the courts do. I think the the biggest obstacle that we have is the cutbacks in uh, civil servants. Um, so normally, uh, when we um, when they started the FOIA law, they were thinking that for every government body, we would need either fifteen or twenty civil servants to to actually uh, handle the, all these requests. And now, even with the biggest ministries, you might be lucky if there is even one uh, FOIA person there. Uh, normally, it's a job that is either combined with other legal work or uh, sometimes they just don't have it. There is an intern that has to help or there is uh, there's much more uh, being done, being invested in communication departments than in FOIA departments, which I think is a terribly shame. Um, and I think the state of the archives is the biggest trouble. Um, there has been many reports that the Dutch archives are really deplorable and that uh, there needs to be massive investments. So sometimes I also speak to these FOIA uh, um, civil servants and, and they basically say, we don't even have access to all these different um, computer systems anymore. Sometimes there are either 10 or 15 running at the same time. We need to email um, other government officials to please beg them to give them the emails or the documents or to look for them. Sometimes they cannot even look themselves, which is a huge problem. So I think a lot of actually uh, the backlash that we receive as journalists is coming from this, these cutbacks on, uh, on, on government officials and on these archives. Um, and now you, and they're trying to, to just, get rid of the, the requests. So now they're investing in, in obstruction methods. They keep lists of all the journalists that are doing uh, free, frequently used to FOIA. And they, it's, it's basically like an Excel sheet. They can just see from uh, which journalist goes to which, uh, how far will they go to get the information they need. And if they find out that the journalist is not going further than, for example, the appeal phase, then they will fight it even longer making sure you don't get the information. So it's, yeah. it's so Dean, it's, it's definitely not a Swiss watch. It's, it's actually, we're, we're, we're one of the slowest uh, uh, countries uh, in the world uh, handling FOIA. Uh, I'm open to anybody else typing a, raising your hand or typing a question. Meanwhile, um, I just note that when I came over here after a long career in the US, um, the emphasis on um, 
FOIA in, in Europe is actually, there's a, a lot more of it and journalists are much more, use, use it more often here than in the US. For me, we kind of assumed that it was, it was just not worth it. Hmm. It was just not worth the time. It was going to take too long. And it depended always on, um, you know, the, the goodwill and good intentions of, of government bureau bureaucracies. And I guess that's just been, been, it's been sort of my attitude, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad to see that it's so, vi you know, it's, it seems to be quite, quite vital and more vibrant in its use here, The people haven't given up on it. And I, in, and in Blanca's case, it, it seems to have paid off um, handsomely. Um, what I'd ask you though is uh, talk to us about the scope. I mean, if you're, we have journalists on the call here, I see, um, talk to us about the scope of, of, of mapping out the scope of a FOIA request because you went pretty broad, right? And did you debate that? Did you worry that that was going to give um, the government yet another excuse to slow the train down or how do you think about how did you think about the scope of of the of your request when you were framing it um yeah well it was of course very broad it was one of the biggest uh foia requests uh, ever done in uh, in dutch foia history um but the government is using this is already too broad uh all the time uh, if you're asking sometimes for 500 documents you already hear, we're not going to handle your request because it's just too much work for us. So this argument is nothing new. But with the shell papers, you could actually say that uh, for the first time they have, uh, they have something to complain about. But on the other hand, um, this was a long time coming. Uh, there's been so many questions about the, the relationship between the Dutch government and Royal Dutch Shell that... This, this was in the works. And um, like I showed you in my presentation, uh, we, we stumbled upon this close relation in many FOIA requests. So that's why we decided to do a big request. And that's why we're trying to work with the government with a plan. So for example, we could have done thousand FOIA requests. It would have been smaller batches, but they would have faced the same problem. I think it's better to, to, uh, to actually sit with us and to, to find out how we uh, can help each other along the way. And I think the first step is to make visible what you have, because this is always the black box in Dutch for you. You ask for a request, you have a request. Sometimes you know the title of the documents, but most of the times you don't. So you ask them, I want everything concerning this and that, or for example, relating Orban. And well, they have to actually search. They're the only ones that can do that. We don't have a beautiful system like in Norway where you can actually see what they have. So um, we're always trying to ask for inventory lists. So if they say it's too broad, okay, that's fine. But then I want to see what kind of documents you have. What is your ser first search results if you look for, for example, Shell? And... Um, this is how I'm trying to tackle every FOIA request I do. Um, if you say it's too broad, show me the inventory list and then I'll get to work. And then it's, it should be me doing the work that, uh, in choosing the right documents. But not knowing what they have is already a limitation uh, in transparency. Right. Can, I, can I ask, do, do you have, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna know your business or, uh, or uh, have you uh, reveal something you don't intend to, but can I ask you at least, do you have a, a, um, a, a story budget or a set of, set of concepts that you are, hunches that you're working with now? You don't have to tell me what they are. Yeah. We do. Uh, or, or, um, or, or you just kind of have an open mind. You just want to see what they have or how are you, how are you, you know, technically working through the, you know, basically in the end, the end of the day, Bozzy, I assume you want to, you want to produce great stories. Yeah. So how are you, how are you working? How are you, where are you in the, on, in, in, in that, in that progression from concept to idea, to, to, to budget, to, to written story? So, so actually writing a good FOIA request is already a research in itself. Uh, even though it's not an article, because you need to know which government body actually holds the documents. 
So you could say that we took around half a year to come up with the government bodies that we chose for this request. And for that research, we talked to maybe uh, dozens of people uh, um, and really did some deep research to see um, how the connections between Royal Dutch Shell and the, the Dutch government actually are. Uh, and we are using that pre-investigation uh, now in our uh, current publications. So we are working on many stories uh, because of this research that we already did. Um, so I think a FOIA is actually a great starting point for a larger investigation because it teaches you the document trail between, I think this is the biggest lesson we always give to uh, people that start FOIA is you have to learn how the government works and how their document trail works. And if you understand yeah, yeah. this better and better, you, you get the most beautiful uh, tips uh, for, for new publications.